All right, so we're talking about oil coolers. <laughs> All right, many engines use an oil cooler. Use is a U-S-E. Thank you, Kevin. All right, many engines use an oil cooler. Not all of them. Not all of them, but, you know, most of the bigger ones, when I think about the ones that don't, uh, that list includes the uh, Cessna 150s with their, their O200s, uh, anything with an A65, basically anything with a small Continental, um, and eh, some of the O300 Continentals, but even the Lycoming 235, the smallest Lycoming, that goes in the 152, does use an oil cooler. All right, so Lycoming... Lycoming tends, and by tends, I mean they do, uh, tends to use a remote oil cooler, to use a remote, remote oil cooler. Now, before you think about a type of oil cooler that you has buttons on it that you use <laughs> while you're sitting on the couch, I mean to say that it is not attached to the engine. It is somewhere else. So that means you must use hoses and stuff to get the oil to and from. All right, so Continental. Continental tends to use oil filters or oil coolers that mount uh, to the crankcase. And not just mount to the crankcase, they are integral to the crankcase. If you were to remove the oil cooler, you would have a large gaping hole at the side of the case because that it makes up part of the case. The case is pre-drilled for oil holes that just come out, right? It has a whole pad that uh, has an inlet and an outlet and everything. And so if you didn't have an oil cooler on, it would just shoot oil right out the, right out the side of the crankcase. Why oh, do you look at me funny, Mark? Is feel like that wouldn't be as effective. Well, okay, so here's the upsides and the downsides. If you have a light combing and you have the oil cooler mounted, say, to the firewall, or a lot of times they mount them way up front as part of the engine baffling, all right, you've got to run an oil hose from the back of the engine all the way to the front. And what happens to those oil hoses is they run over the top of the cylinder and down and they get baked and they get hot and they don't last very long. But people just ignore it and they keep running it and running it. And if you get a hole in one of the oil hoses, what happens? You're going to lose all your oil and hopefully you don't have a fire. All right. So Continental, on the other hand, they've completely eliminated all oil hoses, mounts right to the, the crankcase. There's a, a mounting spot for it. It's right a part of the design. So you have no hoses. Uh, the only leak you would possibly have is a, a gasket leak if something came loose. So honestly, I'd rather have the Continental style where it mounts right to the right to the engine. So it, you give up some cooling for longevity? No, it, it'll, they mount them right up front. So they're right in the front. So you got the you know your your last cylinder that's right in front. Oh, okay. I was picturing like on the crankcase, like in the middle. Sticky. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I wonder if I have a. I must have a picture. Let's see. Picture's worth a couple of words at least. Right? And I can see world. Oh, almost. The other side. No. There we go. There's our oil cooler right, up there. right there. And nothing. Well, I say nothing. There's a lot of things that drive me crazy. This is one of them. I've talked about that. Imagine, if you will, I bring my Ferrari into uh, MJ to change the oil in it. There's your first problem. And MJ decides to write all over, you know, and it's a nice, uh, what is it? Um, F40. F, I was, I was going to say F4. That's really old. But uh, what's the number? Uh, 438, 443? No. Four, yeah, 438. It did not be a spider, but it's got the mid-engine. It's got the glass in the back. looks really sweet. And you decide to write down the spark plug part numbers or date all over my, my nice red valve covers. Do you think I would be a little perturbed? <laughs> because how much is, let's say, used a 438 Ferrari? I don't know. Like, maybe 70 grand. Salaries. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, you know, we're talking a nice one. We're probably talking, I don't know. A decent one, at least. Well, let's we'll say 150,000. Oh my goodness! All right. Well, guess how much a 40-year-old uh, Cessna 182 is going to run me? A couple hundred grand, depending on condition. 
at least 150,000. Nice one. Decent. You get something that's got the new engine, three blade prop, leather interior, and good instrumentation that's in the 70s, the 1970s. You're, now you're looking at 200,000. Do you want to buy something made in the eight? I mean, when did they stop making them? They still, because they only make 206s now, huh? Uh, I think they still make 182s. Oh, you're right, they do. So it's the 182T is what they call them, right? Uh, well, they make that in the regular 182. All right, but either one of those, let's say in the 19, late 1990s version, what do you think, half a million? Oh, yeah. Yeah, half a million. That's a couple of Ferraris in the driveway. Don't write on this point. But I will give you this. If you are working on an aircraft that's a Cessna 182, which I believe this is, and the baffle looks like that, this is an owner who doesn't give a crap about his plane and does not care if you write on it. So. But that's in the logbook anyway, so why? I know. Don't write on stuff. All right, uh, it tends to use oil cloud, not to the crankcase. There we go. Now we understand that. Uh, let's see. So that's why I don't take my Ferrari to MJ. <laughs> well, there's two reasons why I don't take it to him. That's the primary reason. <laughs> that was reason number one is I don't have one. You do have a Benz, bro. Yeah, reason number two is simply, I don't know which dealership he really works at, but I would trust him. I really would. Uh, let's see. Oil coolers. Oil coolers look like and act like and smell like and taste like small radiators. Small radiators. Well, a radiator in your car, you guys probably don't work much on your radiators in your car, but water flows through very, very small passages in there. And it has cooling, aluminum cooling fins, well, they are aluminum now and plastic, the aluminum cooling fins where the water runs through a very small jacket and it transfers that heat to all the cooling fins that you see. And that's why you don't want to get in there and pressure wash it when you're the car wash because it bends the little fins over and then it blocks the air from going through. So fins got to be straight, air's got to flow through, and they look like small radiators. Oh, let me see. So they have small passages. They have small passages. They have small passages uh, through cooling fins. Through cooling fins. Cooling fins. Through cooling fins that dissipate heat. That dissip that, that, can't even see what that is. That dissipate. Heat to the atmosphere or air. All right, so the problem with that is they have small passages. What happens to said small passages? They get clogged with what? They act like an oil filter. So I have witnessed, not been part of, people who have overhauled engines that have had some sort of contamination, and you say, well, what about the oil cooler? And so we had, so imagine if you will, this is a very long time ago and this person's not in the field, so don't even, don't, don't complain to me. So the washer we have all the way in the corner with a little brush on it. So what he'd do is he'd like take the brush off and he would just stick it in the, the uh, one end of the oil cooler and just turn it on and let it run all day. So you know what that did for me? Clean my solvent. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't blow out. So if you think about it, if you have some sort of container that, that has all these passages and you put liquid into a manifold that can then go through any one of, let's say, 20 or 30 passages and one of those 30 is block, plugged up, where is all the stuff going to go? Through the other ones. Until you put it on the engine and maybe get it up to a nice 75 PSI, which do you think that the washer we have is 75 PSI? I know ours was, and it was about 10 at the most. So you get, now you actually get to that stuff blown out. That's what will really clean it out. So that is not a good idea. So um, I can say contamination. Contamination gets caught. Gets caught. 
gets caught in the small openings, in the small, in small openings. So cl uh, clean well, clean after contamination. Could you send them off and get them like oil valve basically? Pacific Oil Cooler was the place of my choice. And so when I took over the engine shop, I said, never will I do that. And they went off to Pacific Oil Cooler. I don't know if they're still in business, but I really enjoyed working with them. And what they do, they actually take and desolder the tank and run brushes through everything and put the tank back on. Or I don't know, they got a cleaning method or something. But the only way to really make sure they're all clean is to des that's how you do radiators on cars. You take your car you know, to a radiator shop, that's, they pull off the tank and they brush every one of the, um, the whole, the, what do you call it? Rotten core. The core, yes. And that's what they called it, right? Rotting, rotting the core. Rot, rotting, rotting, I guess. Rot, yeah, they called it rotting the core. So, and that happened because, well, it still happens because you don't use good water. You use water with a lot of minerals. Minerals clog up the core. So, you, back in the old days, you would take them in because they were brass and they would desolder and rot, rot the cores. So, anyway. Um, some oil coolers. <coughs> Uh, have an outer core and an inner core. Have an outer and inner core. I don't know if I want to get into this. Um, do you have Q and A's about the water, the the jacket? I forget to look. Yeah. One yeah, question. there's one question about the jacket. I think that's why I went in there. And I think that's what this one was about. All right, so I'll just write this. So very, very cold oil bypasses the cooler. Bypasses the cooler. Um, yeah, we'll with that. Actually, I'll just put this because this is out of... The surge valve. I don't want to get too much into this dual radiator because they're just not common. I don't. I've never even seen one. Surge valve is like thermostat in the car, right? I think so. That's what they're calling it. So, okay, when oil is the correct temperature, is correct, correct temp, which means warm. Um, oil flows around jacket. Oil flows around the jacket. Oil that is too hot flows through cooling fins. All right, but that's, like I said, the, the, these coolers at the inner and outer core, I've never even seen, if I've seen one, I don't know that I've seen one. Most of them just have, they're a single, a single piece, single core unit. Let me see that picture. No. Well, that's, that's as, as close as, as good as anything right there. So it's just a single core. And the way it normally works on, on all the modern engines is you have some sort of thermostatic control valve. And Continental tends to call them thermostatic control valve. And Lycoming tends to call them a Verna therm valve. And this is one out of a Lycoming. Continental's doesn't look a whole lot different than this. But as I explained the other day, it is just a valve that when it gets hot, it expands. And when it gets cold, it shrinks. And when it is hot, and so we start out in the cold position, right? So you start your engine up on a cold day, and this thermostatic valve, let me see, there's got to be a way here. The way this drawing shows it, it only has one path. It goes through the oil pump, uh, through the oil screen, directly into the oil cooler, and then out to the bearings. But in reality, there, you see it better if I do that? In reality, there's got to be a secondary passage here that bypasses the cooler because I don't want cold oil going to the cooler. I only want hot oil going to the cooler. I want to warm it up. I want to get it going. Same way with your car. You got a little thermostat 
it doesn't want the water to go through the radiator and when it's cold it wants it to warm up the water so so again shrinkage when it's cold expands when it's hot and so we start out with a cold engine it is going to open up a passage that allows it to go from the oil filter directly to the engine now it's not a big deal i don't have to shut down the route to the oil cooler but i just told you the oil cooler has what kind of passages small, small passage so the oil's not really happy going that way anyway it's kind of a it's kind of a rough path it's easier to go off into the engine so we open the thermostatic bipack valve because everything is cold and then as the engine starts warming up this thing starts to expand it starts closing off the passage directly to the engine and starts forcing more oil through the oil cooler well at some point this is going to get hot enough it's going to seat down on its seat and all of the oil has to go into the oil cooler and off to the engine so it's just really that simple how it works So, uh, oil to the cooler, oil to cooler is controlled by use of a thermo static or thermo thermostatic control valve. Also called a vernotherm. Vernotherm valve. Vernotherm valve, thermostatic control valve, oil cooler bypass valve, it goes by all of those names. So a cold valve is open, a cold valve is open and allows oil to bypass the cooler. Two. As oil heats up, heats up, valve expands and forces oil to the cooler. Uh, some interesting things about vernothern valves. They cause a lot of problems. and have been the source of a lot of mechanic <laughs> kind of losing their head. Number one, uh, <clears throat> there's an AD on them, or at least a critical service bolt, now I don't remember. So if I pull this back against the spring, there's a little nut, there's a little nut right there. It's hard to do because the spring is tension. That little nut tended to fall off. Yeah, a little nut would fall off, get the engine, then all this stuff would just fall apart. So I didn't crimp that nut on very well, so it became this big problem about having to replace a bunch of these. This is probably why this is here. And uh, because the nut would fall off, so he had to check the date and stamp code on the back and change all these out. But uh, the way light combings are set up, it's unfortunate, is that the, the um, I don't know if that one diagram says it, the temperature bulb is very close to this. see here oil cooler bypass nah this isn't going to do it for me so i will just tell you that so so what would happen is this thing was supposed to get hot and was supposed to close and so oil coming into here is hot and it wasn't supposed to go through the hole past the oil temp bulb and off to the engine it's supposed to be closed off forcing it to go to the cooler out of the cooler right across the temp bulb into the engine but these would leak and it would leak just a little bit of hot oil not very much but a little and that little bit of hot oil would leak through here and go to the very next thing which was the oil temperature bulb so while most of the oil was not very hot 
apparently enough of the hot oil would just get onto that thing and give you a false indication, which you'd think you would mix and not, but uh, Lycoming is pretty adamant about that's what was happening, which was not very fun. So, so it gave an indication of much hotter oil than what it really was. And I don't need to write that. I just thought it was interesting. Whenever you say oil temple, I'm always coming up with a little confused. What do you mean by oil temple? That's a really good question. So one of the ways that oil temperature is taken is you can use an electronic type that has, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like a thermal couple, which is two dissimilar metals. And when you heat it to a certain temperature, it gives off a small amount of voltage that goes to a, a gauge. It's really a voltage gauge, but it's calibrated to read temperature. Or you have what's uh, a bulb type, which doesn't use any electricity at all, but it's got an actual, uh, it, it, we call it a bulb. I don't know. It, it looks like a, a brass light bulb that won't light up. So I could draw a picture for you, but it would be meaningless. <laughs> We've learned that. And so it's called the temperature bulb, and that's the thing that goes into the engine. And so it's a probe. A probe would be a much better nice, the temperature probe. But we call it a bulb. So temp but the temperature probe. So you stick the probe in. I'm just making Robbie laugh. So... Um, <laughs> So you stick that into the engine, and then it's a tube. And so what happens is the gas in that expands because of heat, and it causes pressure to go up the tube into a pressure-calibrated uh, device. It's reading PSI calibrated to temperature. Here's my second kind of follow-up. You lose your electrical then if you have the electrical bulb. No. Electrical, would you no. Neither, neither one of them use battery power. Oh, okay. So the, the first one, the thermal couple, is its own electrical source and voltmeter. Dissimilar metal causes a microvoltage. That microvoltage flows through the meter. The meter is reading voltage calibrated to say temp. In the temperature bulb type, the air expands in there, and that expanding air causes a pressure change, which is on a gauge that's reading pressure calibrated to show uh, temperature. Um, all right, so Vernathur valve, I talked about that, S problems, uh, the leaks, we have the service bulletin, we have the leaks, etc. I don't know, but wait, I don't know, all right, some aircraft, some aircraft use a floating control thermostat, which is kind of a weird thing, use a floating Anyway, floating control thermostat. To control, to control the airflow through the cooler. So their idea is, hey, just let the oil go through the cooler. What makes the oil cooler work is the airflow going through it. So if you block off the airflow through it, we should just call them shutters or louvers, would have been a nice, my, nicer word. If you just block the air going through it, then the oil's not gonna get cool. Or you can control a little bit of air or not so much. I know that you've got a lot of questions about dry sump versus um, wet sump, and I tried to distill this down and make it very simple here, dry sump. So dry sump engines, it goes scavenge pump. Scavenge pump. Um, two cooler. Two tank. Scavenge pump, to cooler, to the tank. So we have the main pump. Let's hope this drawing is actually accurate. Let's see. Let's see if it's empty. It follows through. I don't remember what it does. So we have the, the oil cooler tank, draws from the bottom, goes to, oh, look at oil temperature bulb. Hey, I'm <laughs> oil temperature bulb. We're taking the temperature before it into goes into the engine. All right. Uh, through the oil screen and a check valve. What's a check valve there to do? In this case, when we shut down, it wants to keep all this oil from going this way. I want to say that the Bonanza, it's down on this end, 
because you don't want the tank is higher and you don't want the um, yeah, but if the outlet's up here, uh, maybe I'm just screwing that one up. All right, it's high enough that it goes to this part. That's what it is. It's high enough that it does go back this way. See, it wouldn't work this way. It, the tank drains through the pressure pump and fills the engine case. That's what I mean to say. Because the tank is up here. And so it runs down this way. This way you're looking at it and going, what, you're worried about all this oil flowing back this way? Well, that doesn't make sense. There's not a whole lot of it. So, but if the tank is higher, it goes this way through the pressure pump gears and into the case. Well, but we still have a check valve that only allows it to go one way and it don't really worry about going this way, but there is usually, I hope I'm getting this right, you put a spring on it that if you don't have at least a certain amount of pressure, the oil doesn't just go dumping in. You've got to prevent this case from filling up from the, from the cooler tank and our Bonanza does that. The engine fills up with the tank and so when you look at the tank, you say, wow, we are out of oil. But start it up for a second, and all this, once the scavenge pump runs, it empties out the crankcase and fills up the, the oil uh, tank. And so if you top off the oil tank and then start the Bonanza, you're going to be looking for, you'll, you'll be picking up a lot of oil off the floor really quick. So anyway, uh, points goes from tank, oil temp bulb, before it goes into the engine, Oil pressure pump. It wouldn't be bad to put the oil the, the uh, bulb here either. So uh, the point is, it's got to be before it gets to the engine. So pressure pump, oil pressure right after that goes to the engine, comes down the case, scavenge pump, then cooler, then tank. So this one's cooling it right before it goes into the tank. Engine driven or yes, okay. they're usually a duplex pump, which means it's two pumps in one. Okay. So it's, uh, but they're separated. So you have one drive shaft will drive two pumps. Now which one's bigger? Scavenge, Scavenge pump. All right. So wet sump. And there's going to be some variations here depending on manufacturer. Uh, it goes oil pump, oil pump, bypass valve. Uh, oil cooler, or not, but under normal operations, again, an oil cooler, um, to filter, and then engine. I don't know, and I think it's going to depend upon engines. I think one does it one way and one does it another. It de sometimes it depends on what book I'm looking at and what, let's see. Uh, that's not going to show me that. This one goes pump, oil cooler bypass, cooler, then the screen. So this one goes oil cooler first, then the pressure screen, then off. I was talking about the one that had your, the, gal the galleries that you were trying to explain. The textbook one. Oh, yeah, the one from the textbook. Uh, well, because this one for sure is light combing, and this one is a continental case, you can tell by the oil sump. So, but it's just a textbook. Could be right, could be wrong. Looks like an O300. Oh, that's right, thank you. Because the camshaft is on the bottom. Uh, what am I? Seven oil. See, oil is usually cooled after it has run through the engine and before it is sent to the tank or pumped to the engine. So oil is cooled, cooled after it runs through the engine, through the engine. Um, it's cooled after it's run through the, yep, after it run through the engine and before, and before. It is sent to the tank on a dry sump um, or pumped to the engine. Pumped to the engine. And then I've already said this, oil is, oh, oil temp, oil temp 
is taken. Before or after it goes in the engine? Before. Before. Before it, oil temp is taken, before it enters the engine. Minimum oil temp should be what? Minimum, wow, you guys are good. Oil temp is 180 degrees. Why? The engine will add 50 and that will keep it. There we go. All right, I think that's all I have to say about oil. Except, except, what about, in, what about aerobatic engine? Yup. A lot of check valves. A lot of check. Okay. I don't know if you can see this real well. The Lycoming had an engine, and I've never seen one. They're be they're really rare, and they were called the. Uh, uh, well, there's the A E I O, and the A E. And I think the A E was the precursor, the old one. It had an oil sump on the top and oil sump on the bottom. And it was uh, created in the case. They're really expensive. Then they came out with the AEIO, uh, aerobatic engine, or the AE instead of, and that is what most of your aerobatic airplanes have now, is the AE versions. And what they use is what's called a Kristen, uh, hey, all right, Kristen, Kristen oil system. And I think that has something to do with the Kristen Eagles. If you don't know what a Kristen Eagle is, they're, they're cool planes, biplanes. Um, but under normal flight, it uses this big check ball valve system and this oil, uh, air oil separator. So under normal flight, normal conditions, this is the oil sump down here. This ball check, these check ball valves are worked off gravity. So gravity has got them pulled in this position. So what happens is we have a suction tube right here. The suction tube comes up. These ball valves drop down. This one's dropped down. So it's allowed to suck oil, go to the engine. We have the, we still have to have a crankcase breather, which breathes through here. This ball valve is down because of the gravity. And this is an air oil separator that separates out any oil that might be there and flows supposed to, supposedly clean air overboard and any oil is just dropped back into here. All right, so normal flight. Then we go upside down and all of the oil falls to the crankcase. This is actually called the backbone of the crankcase. Boom, everything is inverted. So this becomes the oil sump now, and the engine looks just like yours. And so all of the gravity moves all of this stuff to the other side. So now the oil pump's got to suck something, so it realigned it so that it's sucking it from right here. This used to be the breather, but now it's the suction. So it sucks it here, but we still need a breather. But now this line here becomes the breather, and it goes out. So you can fly all day and won't lose any oil. And because it's got a um, fuel injection system, fuel injection doesn't know which way is up anyway. So it'll just fly all day. The only thing you have to worry about now is the fuel tank. You have to have a weighted uh, line in it that will flop down and follow the fuel and a vent system on the tanks or just small enough holes that it just leaks out slowly. Yeah. So in inverted flight, I can understand this. But what about these guys that do all these tumbling yeah. things where there's G's going everywhere? And does it just switch back and forth all the time? I, I think the oil is just gives up at that point. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> I have no idea. It's which so fast, the oil is just suspended. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. It just it just kind of fills the whole crank. It is fill the crankcase up, I think. I don't know. I know. It is awful. I feel sorry for those engines. It'll burn off if it's uh, <laughs> centrifugal force. Right. So yeah, cold in this or but they're tumbling. Alright. Right? Cover that, cover that. Oh, I'm gonna read that down there. Oil system in the Bonanza oil system is oil fed to the engine pump from a supply tank mounted just above and behind the engine. Hey, I was right, it is above the engine. The oil return is picked up by the oil the oil return is picked up by a scavenge pump and returned to the supply tank, passing through a cooler which is an integral part of the tank. The oil capacity is yeah, two and a half gallons. 
the filler neck of the A35 is accessible for raising the left engine cowling. The beats has access door. The level should be checked after each flight. You dipstick, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, both oil pumps, the oil screen, and check valve to prevent oil from draining from the tank into the engine sump are incorporated into the engine accessory section. There is no engine oil shutoff valve, and the system is so designed that oil bypass arrangements are unnecessary, according to them. Uh, this is the rear case of a smaller Continental, uh, O200, O300, IO360s, they're all pretty much the same thing. And the oil filter is right down here, and so that's the part where it had a screen and a cap, and you can just take it out and put in a, um, an adapter, an ADAPT kit, if you will. Cover that, cover that, cover that, good to go. All right. Sounds like that's about it for tonight.